We're going to have kind of a you know, rundown of all things intellectual property as they pertain to founders and startups. Um, so we'll start with a kind of a straightforward presentation. Then we will open it up to a panel discussion. We'll uh, add a couple of uh, past Arch Grants awardees onto the stage, and we'll have some questions and answers. And hopefully you guys have some questions, too, for all of them that they, I'm sure, would love to answer. So that's the plan. Hopefully that all sounds good to you all. Who are we? What's Arch Grants? So Arch Grants is a nonprofit. We're a 501c3. Our mission is to support St. Louis's economy by awarding and supporting, supporting extraordinary entrepreneurs, getting them to stay in St. Louis or come to St. Louis and grow their businesses and, and their lives here. So we, uh, we do that with our startup competition where we award equity-free funding and we also provide a host of wraparound services that are arguably even more useful and impactful for your business. And so since our first competition in 2012, we've awarded over 250 companies. And you can see by these numbers here that they are really making an impact um, in the form of thousands of jobs, hundreds of millions in revenue, hundreds of millions in capital raised. And we've done that through $16.4 uh, million in funding so far. We're going to do a panel in a little bit. But I wanted to start off by introducing our first speaker who's going to do all of that laying out the groundwork of all things IP. And that is Mr. Bruce Campbell, who is an intellectual property attorney at Stock Legal LLC. So please welcome him over. Thank you. Thank you. How's everyone doing today? Good, good. good. So uh, I've been doing this for now going on 28 years. Um, I started my career uh, in a different field, actually. Uh, when I graduated law school, I was hired by a firm to be an employment lawyer. So uh, I was in Kansas City at the time. I'd come home to St. Louis. People would ask me, you know, what I do. Employment lawyer, wow. You know, I had all these stories about all this crazy stuff people did in the workplace, how these clients were getting sued for all this crazy nonsense, right? So my family loved it. Thanksgiving, you know, I could hold court and tell people all these crazy stories. Um, Two years into my legal career, the firm that I was with um, started their intellectual property practice. And my technical background is in chemical engineering. So the firm knew I had an engineering degree and they thought, hey, you've got the background for this. We're starting this new department. You know, we'd like you to, to, to join it. Quite honestly, at the time, I didn't even really know what intellectual property was, but it sounded like kind of a good opportunity. Um, when I came home as an IP attorney, the conversations around the dinner table were a little different because when people would ask what I do and I said intellectual property, they kind of looked at me and had no idea what I was talking about. So, um, you know, when I interact with people commonly, when I interact with clients, um, it's quite common that there's a bit of mystery around what exactly is intellectual property. Um, is, you know, a business owner, uh, some of the things that I'm going to go over with you today, maybe not all of it will, will apply, but I think it's super important for you to at least understand that um, there may be some, uh, some assets uh, that are very val valuable to your business, um, and it's very important to understand how to identify them, um, how to actually create uh, these rights, and how to secure them and protect them. So those are some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's a very complicated area of law, and I've got a very short amount of time. So basically, this is just enough of an overview that, um, you know, when you go back to your, your day to day, um, it, it, it's going to allow you to maybe just start to, to understand how these things may apply uh, to you and your business. Um, the three main types of intellectual property are uh, patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Um, a lot of times I'll get uh, a client call me and they'll say, um, I think I have uh, a, a new name for our business and I, and I want to patent it. Or I'll have a client say, we've got this great new idea and we want to make sure nobody steals it from us, so we want to trademark it. So people get very confused. They maybe know just a little bit about what these words mean, um, but what I hope to to do today is to really just sort of give you an idea of exactly what these things actually mean. Um, so the first thing we're going to start out with is uh, talking about patent rights. Um, patent rights are exclusionary. And what that means is um, if you have a patent, 
Uh, you don't need a patent to actually practice an invention that, that you've created and that you own. What a patent does is it allows you to prevent other people from making, selling, and using your invention. So in the simplest terms, what you're basically trying to do with a patent is create a one supplier monopoly on your invention. So obviously, uh, let's just say like you're in manufacturing and you come up with this great new <clears throat> apparatus. Uh, no one else uh, has ever made it. No one else is selling it. You hire a patent attorney, you file a patent application, you successfully obtain a patent. Um, for basically 20 years from the date that you file your patent application, if you're successful in, in obtaining a patent, you have the exclusive right to make, sell, and use your invention. So obviously, um, if it's a hit, then you're going to be able to fully exploit it without competition by, by owning a patent. So that's basically what it, what it does. Um, like I said, these rights are exclusive. Um, making uh, the invention um, all, also... Um, if you uh, have a patent, you have exclusive rights to import it as well. Um, and that's something I'll, I'll address a little later too, is that patent rights are, are territorial. Um, some of the things that, that make patents valuable, um, you can assign your patent rights for value. So there are situations sometimes where an inventor um, may not have, let's say, the manufacturing capability or the distribution capability to commercialize uh, an invention that they've patented. Um, one thing that you can do as a patent owner is you can negotiate uh, with another company, for example, uh, allow them to do all the heavy work, right? You can, you, can, you can assign your rights, in other words, sell your rights to the patent um, to a company and you can get a lump sum payment, you can negotiate for an ongoing royalty. So, so there's value that you can gain from a patent without even actually having a, 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 a practicing um, business that exploits that invention. Um, you can also uh, license your patent rights. Uh, so unlike an assignment, if you want to uh, retain the rights to your patent, um, it allows you to basically negotiate with more than one party to license the technology. So instead of basically approaching company A, B, and C and saying, hey, I've got this patent, it's worth a million dollars, I will sell it to you outright for a million dollars. Um, you can basically approach 10 different companies that are willing to pay, let's say, even more than a million, and you can separately uh, negotiate licenses um, with those licensees, and they would be non-exclusive licensees. So that's just an example of, of another way that you can exploit your patent rights. Um, patent rights also can be very important in terms of securing funding and financing. Um, I personally have never really seen the show Shark Tank, but my daughter watches it all the time. And every time I walk by and I see her watching it, I always hear people being asked, Do you, have you filed a patent? Do you, do you own a patent? Um, and so, you know, when you're approaching uh, potential investors, um, they're going to want to know, uh, have you done the necessary work to secure your patent rights? Um, sometimes you can't even get a foot in the door to have those conversations if you um, haven't done what's necessary to secure your patent rights. So that's, that's just another thing to keep in mind. Um, and then also, if you, um, if you have an ongoing business concern and your goal someday is to exit, um, having a very robust uh, intellectual property portfolio could be extremely important in terms of um, the value uh, of your company when you're looking to, to exit. Um, and in some cases, you know, some companies, their IP assets uh, may be their, their uh, most valuable asset. Uh, so what is patentable? Basically, um, it could be a product, it could be a process um, that improves an already known product or process. So there aren't too many things um, uh, that come about that are truly new inventions, something that's never been done before at all. Um, a lot of times when people come up with, with, with new ways of doing things, it could be um, a, a, a software app, it could be a computer program, it could be... Um, 
a, a, a mechanical device, a medical device. A lot of times they're basically um, things that already exist, but the, 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 the invention is, is in the improvement. Um, basically what inventors do is they identify a need and their objective is to find a, a new and better solution to solve that need. Um, so that's usually, usually what the subject matter of a patent would be. Um, when you file a patent application, um, essentially what you have to prove is that your invention is both novel and non-obvious. So in other words, if it's something that's been already done before, um, you, you're not entitled to patent protection. If it's something that maybe hasn't been done exactly the way that you do it, um, but it's obvious in light of what's already known, what's in the state of the art, then that would also be uh, a reason why a patent application could be uh, rejected. Um, patent rights are granted um, country by country, and uh, each country has its own rules and its own independent patent office. Um, most of the clients that I work with uh, here in the U.S. Uh, start out with seeking patent protection in the U.S., and there are several different ways to go about securing protection worldwide, or at least in other foreign countries. And uh, for example, there's something called the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which is essentially a mechanism that allows you to file initially in one country, the US for example, um, and it buys you a, um, a finite amount of time in which you have uh, before you have to seek protection in foreign countries. Um, the uh, life of a patent is measured from 20 years from the date of filing. So that monopoly you have in terms of your uh, patented invention is limited in time. Um, who owns patent rights? Um, so by law, uh, whoever invents is considered um, the owner of a patent. So if you have a company and you have employees and those employees are um, hired to, to invent. Um, it's important to make sure that you have appropriate agreements in place so that, uh, you know, in most cases, uh, when you hire an employee, um, they will sign an employment agreement that requires them to assign the patent rights for anything that they create in the course of their employment with you. Um, absent uh, that agreement, um, even if you employ um, someone, in most circumstances, they would be considered um, still the owner of, of, of any invention that, that they uh, create, um, even if it's on behalf of the company. So that's one of the important things to make sure um, is that you understand um, who would be considered the inventor. Yep. Pardon me? Yes. Once you assign it to the company, can you can you get it back? No. Once once you sell it to the company, it's theirs. So that's the difference between an assignment and a license. So if you wanted to retain ownership rights, um, then you would license it as opposed to assigning it. And I'm talking about a case where the company is your company. Your company. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of the same advice that I think a business lawyer would give someone. Um, uh, a lot of it um, kind of relates to liability, right? So, you know, I have a law firm and it's an LLC because if someone were to sue me for malpractice, I don't want to expose myself personally. Um, so typically for the same reasons, it's better for the, um, the IP ownership to be uh, in the name of the company. Um, let's see. Yep. So that, that's kind of a practical pointer. For anyone who has an, um, a business that they have employees who, who may be inventing things, you want to make sure that you have an employment agreement in place that assigns those rights to the company. I mean, I've had situations, ideally it would be helpful if the, if the company already has that in place, but uh, we've had a situation re recently where a client um, didn't have their uh, employees sign employment agreements at all. They just had them sign an NDA. And so um, they had been operating like that for years. And um, they basically decided to wind the company down. And we had about a half a dozen uh, patent applications and patents um, that had not been assigned to the uh, employees that they 
were essentially terminating. <laughs> so it got a little sticky. Um, we were actually able to still negotiate terms that allowed the company to um, fortunately get the assignments that they wanted. But it was a much difficult, much more difficult conversation than it would have been if they had the appropriate uh, agreements in place on the front end. So that's really sort of a perfect example of why it's important to, to really have the information that I'm providing you today and to have these conversations, whether it's with me or with another lawyer, is um, just sort of kind of knowing enough to know the right questions to ask and being proactive in terms of making sure these things are being taken care of on the front end. Um, because if you're more reactive, these, can, these things become incredibly complicated um, if you're trying to basically put out fires as they happen. Um, patent rights can also be assigned in third-party contracts. So not only in an employer-employee uh, type relationship, but if there are companies that are independent and they're partnering together, um, there are situations where um, joint development agreements um, can be put in place. And again, having a good attorney that can basically help you understand how to negotiate the terms of those, um, because there's many different ways that you can structure those types of agreements in terms of who gets what, um, who owns the IP rights, um, and so forth. Like I said, it's, it's always best um, to get an immediate assignment to avoid problems in the future. Um, even after you get uh, patent rights assigned to you, um, if you were to file a patent application for an invention, um, there are often uh, many uh, types of documents that you have to submit to the USPTO uh, that require signatures from the, um, from the actual individual inventors. Uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind too, is, is usually in those types of, of employment agreements, uh, we include provisions that um, obligate the employee not only to assign their rights, but to also provide full cooperation uh, in the patent process. Um, so the patent application filing process, um, in order to obtain a patent, you have to file a patent application. Uh, there are two different types of patent applications that you can file, uh, a non-provisional or provisional patent application. Um, just to really kind of simplify it, a provisional patent application is one that's never examined by the Patent and Trademark Office. So there are certain circumstances that may uh, justify filing a provisional application. For example, let's say that you've got um, a meeting uh, set up with, with a potential <clears throat> investor <clears throat> and you have a non-disclosure agreement. So that provides you some protection in terms of uh, okay, now I'm going to share this information, um, you know, whether it's a potential investor, maybe it's a potential business partner. Um, there's always still the, the it's, it's not incredibly likely, but, but it happens. People sometimes violate non-disclosure agreements, and that could put your patent rights at risk. Um, sometimes filing a provisional patent application is a, a pretty quick solution to do that, because by do, doing so, you're... Um, basically um, preserving your right to file uh, for that invention with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. The USPTO is a first to file patent country. So basically what that means is if there are two people that just coincidentally come up with the exact same invention and they both file patent applications, it's the party that files their application first that wins. Um, so it's incredibly important to guard the, the confidentiality and secrecy of your inventions before you get a patent application on file. Once you have an application on file, it gives you um, much greater protection in terms of um, being able to prevent other people from essentially stealing your ID and beating you to the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, when you file a provisional application, um, it basically serves as just a one-year placeholder um, before you have to file what's called a non-provisional patent application. And that non-provisional application is the one that the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office actually considers to determine whether or not they're gonna issue you a patent. Um, so basically, uh, what the provisional does, it's, it's, it's kind of like an informal, um, less um, thorough version of the patent application. Um, but what it does for you practically is, it doesn't require as much time um, in expense. So when you, fought, when you hire a patent attorney to prepare a provisional, you're typically paying about, 
anywhere from 50 to maybe three, 75 percent of the, the money that you would have to pay to have a, a full non-provisional patent application filed. And so basically, let's say that you have an idea and you're considering building a business around it and you're considering what your options are in terms of securing patent protection. Um, maybe you have um, potential investors or business partners or people lined up uh, that you want to speak to about this. Sometimes filing a provisional is a great idea because it's going to save you money on the front end and it basically buys you one year of time uh, because you have one year from the date of filing that non-provisional or I'm sorry that provisional before you have to file your non-provisional. So sometimes um, you know startup businesses, entrepreneurs that are trying to save a little bit of money uh, will opt to go the provisional route on the front end and also if you're still not even fully convinced that there's really a, a, a market for your invention or your business, uh, filing the provisional buys you a year of time to essentially um, protect yourself by getting the application on file, but then taking that year's time before you have to file the non-provisional to, um, to basically test the market, see if there's interest. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's two steps to the inventive process. Uh, one, the first step is conception, and then the second step is reduction of practice. And so conception would be um, you just sort of have the aha moment, and you come up with this concept in your head of there's a problem, and I've come up with a very un what I believe is a unique solution to it, right? So that's a concept. Reduction of practice is when you take that concept and you actually figure out how to practically speaking make it work. Um, so essentially that's what the standard is for a patent application is it can't just be an idea, it can't just be a concept. It has to be a concept that's been reduced to practice. And so, um, you know, the reduction of practice can look um, very different depending upon the subject matter that you're dealing with. So if it's like a mechanical device if I have a client that has a, let's say a medical device, um, they typically come to me with a prototype. So that clearly is something that's been fully reduced to practice. Um, sometimes I've had clients like say in the software application industry, they haven't hired a developer yet to actually code their software, but they have come up with a concept of what the software is gonna do. And they, they could even maybe map it out um, in a flow diagram that shows all the steps of what the computer software is going to do. Like that could be enough to be considered reduction of practice. So even though you don't have a, a living, working um, software application, um, just being able to describe it in enough, for some, in enough detail for someone to understand like how it would actually work is, is enough to, to get to the point where you can file an application. Mm -hmm. Is it okay? Because the basis is still the same, but there are advancements. It's not exactly the same thing. Yeah. Does that yeah, that's a great question. So one of the really important... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, the, sorry. Yep. Yes. Yeah, not your problem. Yeah, the question is if you file a provisional application and your invention continues to be developed, when you get to the stage of the non-provisional, is it okay for you to basically include what we call new subject matter in the, in the non-provisional application. Um, yes, you can do that. Now, one thing that's super important when you file a patent application is getting the priority date. That's the filing date. And if you file a provisional application and things change in that year's time, when you file the non-provisional, anything that's considered new subject matter doesn't get the benefit of your earlier filing date. So essentially the new subject matter, um, for purposes of that, it's as if the provisional application doesn't even exist. Um, but yes, you can do that. So, that, so that's, that's one thing that's important is that um, to the extent that you can fully develop your invention, the more thoroughly you can do that at the provisional patent application stage, the better. But it's not necessarily uh, a deal killer if, 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 you, if you don't. 
and even after you file your, your, your non-provisional application, um, once you file that, at that point, you're prohibited from adding uh, new subject matter in that application. But um, there are um, mechanisms where you can file what's called continuation applications um, that allow you to capture new subject matter if you have a, a non-provisional patent application that's, that's still pending. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's very common. Um, you know, companies that have like huge patent portfolios, they, they very often have families of, of patent applications and patents that, um, that are related to one another, but they differ in that from application to application or patent to patent, you'll find new and additional subject matter that's covered. Um, when you file a patent application, basically what the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is going to do is they're, they're going to make a determination uh, as to whether your um, invention is, is novel. So in other words, again, if, if it's something that someone's already done, then you're not going to be entitled to a patent. Um, if it's not something that's been done to the letter, um, but it's obvious in light of what's known in, in, in the state of the art, then that's another reason why the patent office can reject your, your, your patent application. So maybe there isn't something that, um, that, that, that is exactly 100% like your invention, but there may be two or three things that are, that are very, very close. And if someone could basically take those two or three things and sort of combine them to arrive at your invention, that would be um, how non-obviousness um, would, would, would work to reject your application. Um, and then there's also a, a, a subject matter eligibility requirement. And for most uh, inventions, that requirement is very easily met. The one place where um, that uh, becomes very important is with computer software. So um, basically, things that are considered laws of nature, uh, natural phenomena, or purely mathematical, Medical algorithms are not patentable. So an example would be if there's a process that someone could do manually and someone figures out a way to basically automate it by, by, by doing it by way of a, a, a computer program, in the eyes of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, that, wouldn't be, that, that software program wouldn't be considered a patentable invention because you're basically just taking something that can be, that's, that's already known and that's already been done and you're just simply putting it in the context of computer software. Um, so that's a very, very like simplified explanation of subject matter eligibility. And it's led a lot of people to think, well, if I have computer software, I have absolutely no hope in obtaining a patent. And that's actually not entirely true, but it is much, much more difficult. Um, when I have a client approach me and we discuss patents, the first thing that I recommend that they do is um, we, we get a patentability assessment done. And basically what we do is we have a patent search done to find out before we go through the trouble and the expense of preparing and filing a patent application, we want to know whether or not this application is likely to be rejected. So you could basically just prepare the application, pay your patent attorney for it, pay the USPTO fees, um, wait, typically it's about a year, year and a half before you hear back from the Patent and Trademark Office, only to find out that someone has already patented this. There's absolutely no way you can, you can get a patent on this. Um, so one way we can sort of avoid that is by doing a patentability search. Um, the patentability search is also going to uh, give us an idea of what the closest prior art is out there, the state of the art. So if you have something that you think is really, really unique, the patentability search is, is actually going to tell you how unique it is. And there could also be opportunities where maybe we find something in the prior art that would, um, that would tell us that your invention as it currently exists would be patentable, but at least gives you the opportunity to figure out like whether there are some like design changes, for example, that could be implemented to give you a higher uh, likelihood of success if you were to file a patent application. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, when you um, obtain a patent, um, there's, there, there are these numbered paragraphs at the end of a patent called patent claims. And, and those, um, those paragraphs sort of define the, the scope of your patent protection. 
And so ideally what you want in your patent is you want patent claims that are as broad as possible. Um, because if your claims are too narrow and people can very easily design around your, your patent, then technically your patent really isn't worth the paper that it's printed on. So that's, that's another really um, valuable um, thing that comes out of doing the, the patentability assessment is it allows us to basically um, draft the broadest possible patent claims. Uh, we're essentially giving you the, 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 the most value um, when you do hopefully obtain a patent. Um, when you um, are, are considering uh, filing for patents, obviously there's uh, significant cost that's associated with that. Um, like I said before, we usually recommend that we start out with a patentability search. Um, for a patent application, you're paying uh, a patent attorney for his time in preparing and filing the application. Um, most patents require uh, formal drawings, so there's costs associated with hiring a draftsman to prepare those drawings. And then there are fees that you pay to the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, over the course of the life of a patent, um, you have to pay what are called maintenance fees to continue to keep the patent alive. So let's say that you have a patent on an invention and um, six years after you, after you obtain your patent, um, for whatever reason, the invention becomes obsolete, right? Um, instead of having to basically pay for the full 20 years of, of owning that patent, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office basically allows you to pay uh, for your patent protection in chunks of time. So um, at the three and a half year anniversary of your patent being issued, you, your first maintenance fee would come due. So basically allows you to kind of spread those costs over the, the course of the life of the patent as opposed to having to uh, pay all those fees up front. Um, a couple just real quick practical pointers. Um, you, you really have to be aware of what's called a statutory bar. And what that means is if you have an invention and you disclose it publicly, um, let's say, or you offer it for sale or you sell it, um, it basically starts a one-year clock. And from that first um, sell, sale, offer for sale, or public use, you have one year to file a patent application um, to protect that invention. And once that one year time period passes, then you're forever precluded from obtaining patent protections. That's a very important thing to keep in mind. You know, for example, if you're in an industry where maybe you're showing like new inventions like at a trade show or something like that, that would be the kind of thing that could trigger um, um, the statutory bar. Um, be aware of invention and patent marketing services. If you watch TV late at night and you see these guys that pop up in commercials that talk about how they can help you obtain a patent. 99% uh, of those guys are patent attorneys and they're ripping you off. So um, I've had a lot of clients that I've done a lot of patent and trademark work for that have unfortunately wasted um, thousands of dollars working with non-lawyer patent specialists. Um, and we get that a lot in the trademark area. Um, in, with trademarks, and I'll talk about that a little later, um, fortunately, I can usually sort of clean up the mess. Um, but if you work with the wrong person and you don't properly secure your patent rights, um, there could be things that, um, for example, the statutory bar, there could be things that could basically <coughs> potentially um, ruin your chances of obtaining a patent. So, um, I mean, I'm a patent attorney, so I'm always going to tell everyone that you should hire a qualified patent attorney, but it's, it's actually really the truth. Um, once you file a patent application, you sometimes see the, the, the phrase patent pending thrown around. Basically what that means is that you're putting people on notice that you have a patent application pending for your invention. So while you have a patent application pending, you don't have the right to basically exclude people from um, practicing your invention. You can't sue someone for infringement while your patent application is pending. But what it does is it basically kind of holds off your, your competition. So if there's someone that is even thinking that they may want to kind of do the same thing that they see that you're doing, knowing that you have a patent application pending um, basically sort of kind of gives them a disincentive to, to even bother. So um, if you do have a patent application on file, it's always very important to be aware of the fact that 
um, that patent pending status could be of great value. Um, another thing too um, that you may want to keep in mind is that um, you know when we're talking about patents, we're not only thinking in terms of like what you can do to protect your inventions, but we're also um, going to want to be very concerned about making sure that you're not doing something that could subject you to a potential patent infringement liability. Um, so, um, you know, if you're in an industry where there are a lot of companies that, that own patents, um, you know, when you come up with new technologies, it's always very important to make sure that you're um, working with a patent attorney to make sure that you're doing um, the proper due diligence to make sure that what you're doing isn't potentially going to infringe someone else's uh, patent. Um, another thing that's really valuable, valuable about going through that process with an attorney is that uh, if you um, end up being sued for patent infringement, um, one of the um, scary things about that is that if you're found to have willfully infringed, then um, your potential liability can be tripled. So courts have the discretion to basically punish people who uh, infringe patents willfully. And one of the ways that you can defend yourself against a claim of willful infringement is by relying upon an opinion of counsel. So in other words, if you come up with an, um, some new technology and you have a patent attorney do an analysis and he gives you an opinion that says that what you're doing isn't going to infringe anyone else's third party patent rights, um, then that can insulate you in some ways from um, a finding of willful infringement. I already kind of addressed licensing earlier, so we'll skip that. Um, quickly, um, I'll kind of go into trademarks. Um, trademarks basically uh, serve to identify the source of a product or service. So everybody's just familiar with trademarks, or it could be like the name of a company, it could be the name of a product, it could be the name of a service that you offer. Um, basically, the value of a trademark is it, it allows you to basically distinguish yourself from your competition. Um, so by preventing other people from using confusingly similar trademarks for their own businesses, for their own products, um, that's basically what trademark law is designed to do. Um, like I said, trademarks can be, they can be um, names of products, they can be names of services that you offer, um, they can be names of businesses. Um, you know, basically what trademarks are designed to do is to uh, protect the consuming public from confusion. Um, so, um, you know, you've got a business, you've, you know, basically invested a lot of time in uh, developing goodwill, like marketing, people know your product. Um, if trademarks didn't exist, someone could basically just come in and um, create a similar product, let's say, and use the exact same name of that product, put it out in the market, right? So then the consuming public has no idea when they're picking up a product off the shelf, who they're getting it from. And obviously, as a, as, a, as, a, as a business owner, you can see the difficulties that can present if you're not able to protect your, um, your trademark rights. Um, Are we able to use a, a, a picture, like a, a photograph, as a trademark? It, it could, so, so visual things, like logos or, or visual design, can also function as a trademark, like the Nike swoosh. Like Nike has a huge portfolio of, of many different trademarks. So like just do it as a tagline that they have protected as a registered trademark. The, the word Nike is protected as a trademark. Um, their logo is protected as a, as a design mark. Yep. Yep. Okay, yeah, so the question is if you're using somebody else's logo for, or trademark for comparison purposes, is, is that permissible? Um, yeah, that would be considered a fair use. So basically when it comes to trademarks, um, everything boils down to likelihood of confusion. So if you're using someone's trademark, like you've seen in commercials where they're comparing two products. So obviously in order to do the comparison, you have to tell people what the other product is, right? That would be a situation where you're using it for comparison purposes only, and any consumer that, that sees that would, would not be confused. So, I mean, that's basically what it comes down to, is, is trademarks are designed to prevent people from being confused. Um, 
because of that, they're also limited to particular goods and services. So if you have a situation where you have two companies that are using the exact same trademark, um, but they're using it for two completely different types of goods and services, then that would be a situation where two companies can actually technically own the exact same trademark, but they're using them for different purposes. Yep. In the technology, like in the cell phone space, how does how does that work? Like, yep. it, it just have to be certain Pantone colors, certain numbers. So I feel like that could be very hard. Like, how do you how do you do that? I think it's great marketing on their side yep. to protect that. But what does that look like? Is that easy or right? Or so the question is, um, can you basically protect the color as a trademark? And the answer is, in some cases, you can. Um, so like, not all words, not all. Um, designs not all colors can be protected basically what it comes down to is if you have um, uh, let's say you have a certain product and for functional reasons it has to be a particular color right so everybody that every company that creates that same product necessarily has to use that same color that would be a situation where you can't trademark that because by doing so, you're, you're not really um, protecting your ability to identify yourself as a source of a particular good. You're basically monopolizing an as a functional aspect of the product that everybody has to, has to use, right? Um, so like similarly, if you have words that are considered generic or descriptive, in most cases, those types of words can't be protected as, as trademarks. So if you own a bookstore, you can't trademark bookstore because every bookstore has to be able to use that wording to tell people who they are and what they do. Um, trademark rights also can be territorially limited. So if you have a situation where you have two, two, two restaurants and they um, use the exact same trademark, but one's in New York and one's in California, right? And the idea is their markets don't overlap. That would be a situation where um, you could have two concurrent uses of the same trademark. But again, because the markets are, are geographically distinct, there is not a likelihood that people are going to be confused. So that's basically what it comes down to. And, and the, the, the reason why um, people may consider federally registering their trademarks is because that gives you essentially constructive uh, priority nationwide. Um, so a common misconception is that people think you have to register trademarks to have trademark rights. But in fact, when you actually start using a trademark in commerce, that's how you acquire trademark rights. So if you come up with a product, you slap a name on it, you use that as your trademark. Um, before you even talk to a trademark attorney, before you file anything with the US government, you acquire what are called common law trademark rights. So that's like an, another important thing to keep in mind is that you can actually um, uh, acquire those rights simply by using a trademark. Sure. So I have my logo trademark, also the branding within the logo trademark. Yep. Um, and recently came to know that there is a company, I don't know, ice cream business, um, that also is an ice cream business in another state that has a name exactly like mine with the exception of one letter difference. So I think the kind of hurdle easily confused, likely to be confused, uh, for sure has been that. So I, um, and my attorney agreed, and so we talked about the steps being a cease and desist letter, yep. and then in that letter you could be a kind of cordial or forceful if you want to be. Is there, are there alternative approaches that you come across, or is that really Right. So the question is, um, a business owns a trademark. There's another business that's located somewhere else. Same business, essentially uses the same trademark, but maybe it's spelled. There's one letter one that's letter. different. And we did do the searching, and our, my trademark was in place before that company existed. Right. So uh, there's a situation where if you have two companies that are using the, the same trademark, um, in two geographically remote locations, um, then in a manner of speaking, it's legal for both of those um, companies to, to do that. 
And the only time a problem exists is, is when there's a point where their markets overlap yes. and people are likely to be confused. Um, that's when one party then has the right to tell the other party that they can't use their trademark in that particular place. And, and that's where federal trademark registration comes into play because when you file for federal trademark protection, then not only are you limited to, let's say the state that you're operating in, um, for trademark purposes, now you have what's called constructive priority of use nationwide. And so what that means is in that scenario that you described, when those two geographically remote companies overlap, then the, the one that has the federal registration is always gonna have priority, regardless of who, who actually entered the overlapping market first. So in, in, the situa in the scenario that you just described, if I'm representing the company that's received that cease and desist letter, I may tell my client that for now, you can really continue doing what you're doing because there's not a likelihood. Right, yep. So, so, so then it becomes a matter of, of priority. And that's why having a federal registration, if you are, even if you weren't first in time as you're looking to expand, then federal registration is basically gonna give you priority even before you expand, if that makes sense. So I think I'm up against my time, so maybe. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Messiano. I am the portfolio associate at Arch Grants. Uh, so that means that I'm part of the programs team after our founders receive the grant, I'm part of the team that provides the wraparound support services that Joss was talking about earlier. It's great, it's exciting, and I'm really excited to moderate this panel today. I can introduce briefly our two ArchGrants founders who are joining us. Uh, here we have Shower Zhang, uh, the co-founder of Equine Smartbit, a 2018 company, and Gary Kalman, the CEO of ZPods, which was one of our 2021 companies and a 2023 growth grant recipient. And of course, you just heard Bruce. So I think I'll kick things off specifically towards Shower and Gary. Um, if you could just talk over how, as your company has evolved, what, how has your, what is your company's IP strategy and how has that changed? Well, we, Actually, there was one question earlier said, can you file patent with a concept? You can. However, that concept can be novelty, which is what Bruce mentioned earlier. It has to be very concrete concept with the detailed plan, like what you want to do. So that's pretty much is our strategy. We start with a concept, and once you have a concrete plan, you can file it before you have a final product. That way you have your priority date. And the priority date is really important. I think Bruce repeated several times that give you the territory, give you the monopoly, the date that you want. And after that is really expansion because you, there are several ways you can do. You can do divisional pattern. If you product very complex, you want to do divisional patents so that you can protect each segment of the product or process, or you can do a continuation. That way you can add a new matter to it. That, that way you can protect as well. However, if you do that, mind you that you're gonna have a purity day from the very beginning. So if you file the new, new CIP five years later or division continue going five years later, you shall, your life is a short five years. So just a reminder of that. And if really you wanted to do longer, then you have to file brand new patent. So that's a, pretty much our strategy. Depends on how, which state we're at and what product we're developing. And sometimes we file new patent just completely new so that we have the 20 years life, or sometimes we'll do divisional so that we can complete, cover the entire process. And maybe if we could just also go back a little, could you also just tell us about Equine Smart Bit and what products you oh, actually offer? Yes. Yeah. Um, so we, we put a 
the sensors into horse bed, we also have a product to, on the horse tail now to monitor horse biometrics in real time and a continual basis. So monitor the heart rate, the blood oxygen, and, uh, and the temperatures and all the biometrics. So Z-Pods is a customizable safety sleep environment for kids and adults with autism and other sensory issues. Uh, and you know, funny thing is, I was just talking to Shower about uh, you know, licensing some of our technology to use or you know, use with our uh, audience. So uh, our IP protection, uh, we have a, a, well, first I wanted to thank Arch Grants for the growth grant last year. Our team wanted to pass along their thank you. Uh, it's really, it's really uh, grateful. Uh, it's made a big effect uh, starting this year. We've had a triple uh, sales in January and February looks great. So our trans came around the right time. Uh, and it's not just about the money too. Uh, the the uh, whole team and the network that you get from the Arch Grants is, is amazing. So uh, I've you know, met Shower four or five years ago, <laughs> met Bruce four or five years ago. And uh, this goofy photo of me keeps uh, you know, coming up. Um, I lived in China, and that's a wedding photo. I married my wife in China. And uh, so that's why the tux, which I never wear, so, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't get attention. So um, you know, back to our IP strategy, uh, we have uh, just, we have filed a provisional patent because I'm always, uh, I've had several companies, a lot of IP, a lot of patents to my name, and have filled forward learning when to file IP and when not to, and when to spend all your money on IP. Uh, I've also had a lot of clients that I've seen spend hundreds of thousands on IP, and then they didn't have any money to grow or, or have for manufacturing. So uh, that's super important when the timing is, and is if, you're, if you're just beginning your endeavor, uh, you might not know that, so reach out to Arch Grants or experts and Bruce Shower on you know maybe when the right time is to file your IP. So we waited uh, with the uh, Z Pod. Uh, we first started in China, bringing the beds over uh, from Asia, and then re-engineered and redesigned the product to make it in the USA. So we're now we're making it in Minnesota. So once we finished the first shots in our molds and knew we had the technology right and the design right, we filed for provisional because I didn't want to spend a lot of money yet on a filing utility around the world or just in, in the States. Uh, so our timeline is uh, running out in March this year. Uh, I just talked to our patent attorney and, and gave the go ahead to file our utility. Now there's another uh, form of protection that we didn't discuss is copyrights. Yeah. Uh, which could be a very strong for, I don't know if you have a product or service or, or you know, artwork or whatever, but that, that is another uh, form of good production. So we've uh, filed a, a whole list of copyrights for our, the design of our bed and the, the visual arts of it, uh, along with our trade dress and our trademark, uh, which we also had infringement on our trademark. And by common law, we, we proved that we were selling it before they filed uh, federally, so we had that uh, last year. We had to spend money on, so it's all about how much money you want to spend with your your law, your team too, uh, to to fight uh, whatever the infringement is. So uh, also trade secrets, uh, we had trade secrets on our processes. I know Shower does too, uh, which uh, that can be even more viable uh, for when we exit. If we do exit, our company's doing so well. We're doing so, so many great things. It's more of a legacy for me for what we're doing with Z-Pods. Uh, we might want to stay around longer than exiting, but we'll, so we'll just buy our, out our equity holders. Uh, so, uh, you know, depending, we still have a, a good IP strategy. Uh, so, that, um, <clears throat> You kind of touched on this just now, um, but I wonder if you guys could go a little bit deeper, everyone, into, you know, as a startup with so many demands for expenses, how do you evaluate when is the best time to pull the trigger and spend money on IP? Well, I'm cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start with that. Um, normally, this is maybe Bruce doesn't like that. Normally, when I file utility, I, I just write myself. 
because uh, that way you don't pay anybody, right? You don't pay anybody, and if you file yourself, it's only seventy-five dollars. So that's all you need to do. So you spend the time and write that. However, here's a caveat: make sure you you know how to write. You know how, you really read other patent to learn first. Because what it does, like Bruce mentioned earlier, when you file provisional, you can't add a new matter in. So if you did a bad job in the provisional, the non-provisional, then you really just waste the time with the money now, right? So you want to make sure you really know what you, you're doing, at least learn it before you do that. Um, but if you can do that, that will buy you a whole year. Then, then that in the whole year, you can figure out what you want to do, the product, develop a product, or get an investor, or what you wanted to do. Then, like uh, Gary said, that when times run out that, that a year, then you can really decide, okay, now you can spend the money and uh, to pay lawyer, or, or if you don't feel like it, maybe just give it up. So whatever that you want to do. So that's uh, the cheap version. I would assume that when you say that, you're talking about provisional. Pro I sorry, I meant yeah. the non, yeah, yeah the, the provisional. provisional. So, so that's important today. because, again, the provisional application is not going to be examined by the USPTO. So the only thing that's really important about the provisional is you just want to make sure that it has as much of the subject matter. So when you file the non-provisional, so it doesn't even matter whether what you're putting in there, technically speaking, looks the way that it's going to look when the patent's issued. It doesn't have to be organized in a particular way. The, the only thing that you really need to make sure is that it's broad enough to cover what's ultimately going to be in your non-provisional. So I think that that's definitely a very great practical you know, bit of advice, is that if you want to save some money, you can certainly you know, prepare a provisional uh, yourself and just waiting until you get to the non-provisional phase of it. And the key is just making sure that you're putting as much detail as possible so that when you do the non-provisional, there's as little new subject, subject matter as possible. Mm -hmm. so. However, when you go to the utility stage, you do want to get a lawyer involved. And, and the good lawyer is really important. We actually learned the hard way, I told Bruce earlier. We actually, there are some really good patent, and it's terrible. And the patent actually would make hundreds of million dollars. I will say that way. It's a so great patent. However, the lawyer did wrong on the claim. And there are two words ruin the patent. Yeah, just two words, right. That is why I do want to make sure you hire alternative, uh, alternative with uh, experience. Somebody has a good experience, especially I learned that Bruce had a litigation experience, which actually that's really benefits because if uh, eventually the patent, it's pretty easy to get into the litigation stage, otherwise people highly unlikely will pay you licensing fee. So if that's the case, you want the lawyer to do your claims that with experience on the litigation so that he already planned ahead to know what's going to happen down the road. You know, I think the key is when you're thinking about um, talking to an attorney about things like this, at least the way I do it, if a client picks up the phone and they want to talk to me, I'm not on the clock charging them. Like my first contact with the client is let's just talk about like what your business is, what are your objectives, what are you trying to accomplish. I can lay out, you know, based upon my experience, a bunch of different ways that we can do it. But ultimately, it's not really my job to just tell you like what to do. It's my job to just sort of kind of give you the benefit of some information so that you can sort of strategically figure out, um, you know, what's in your best interest. So I mean, I. Unfortunately, you can't say that every lawyer works that way, but it's not my objective to basically just pick up the phone and convince you to pay me to do something for you. My objective is let's figure out whether there's some value that I can give you, right? And you tell me, like, what are your objectives? Like, we just need to make sure this thing is, like, fully protected, and we just got a grant, and we have money, and it's important for us to make sure that we just you know, leave no stone unturned. Like sometimes that's a conversation. Sometimes the conversation is, well, here's where we are. 
you know, we need money to keep the lights on, you know, we need to do this and that. So I can say, okay, well, let's talk about how we can buy you time. So we may have a conversation where you're not even paying me, right? But I'm just sort of kind of giving you the benefit of let's spend an hour and, and figure out what makes the most sense for you, you know? So if you're having those conversations with a lawyer and you don't feel like it's going that way, you probably need to call somebody else. So, you know, that, that's, that's basically what I, I, I take those calls all, you know, all the time. You know, let's, let's just figure out what makes sense because there isn't just like a very like simple blueprint of this is what, how, what you do and this is how you do it. Like if you talk to these two, I'm sure their strategies, you know, in a lot of respects are very, very different. So. Yeah, unless you want to ask just questions. Say, uh, just listen to your patent attorney because I didn't know I got a patent and I have one. And the patent attorney kept saying, just speak broad, get abstract. They didn't tell me their ideas or their opinions, but I just had to listen. And they repeated it. They were giving me great advice and just now I'm piggybacking off an abstract that I wouldn't have come up with if they wouldn't have repeated speak broad. I'll see a question behind you. Can I ask you quickly? So yeah. I, I filed a trademark last year and holy cow. How do you protect yourself from all these people that you see what you did? Is there any way to kind of hide? Because it, it's literally overwhelming the amount of stuff you get thrown at you to do so many videos. And the second one is I have a process that I'm working on that has an algorithm in it. If I find a, if I file a provisional patent, do I, can I genericize the, the algorithm to kind of extend? So the question was how to protect yourself from everyone seeing your trademark after you file it, as well as, can you repeat the second one? Yeah, the second one is if I'm going to file provisional, it can be pretty abstract in, in the process, the process that I'm looking at. There's an algorithm that's really the core of it, mm -hmm. ties it all together. How can I make that general enough to just hold it while I finish it? And then, because as soon as I put it out there, everybody can look at it and try to. Okay, so about generalizing the process that you're patenting to protect the IP publicly. Yeah. Yep, I'll just, so the, the, two, the first question with respect to the trademarks, <clears throat> that is a struggle that the USPTO has been battling for as long as I've been practicing, and unfortunately they haven't come up with a way to do it. So what happens is when you file a trademark application, you're required to basically provide um, a, 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 an address, like whether it's a business address or if it's an individual, it, it can't be like a PO box, it has to be like your address. And so what's happened is there are these like, you know, scammers that basically just, they can see as soon as someone files a trademark application and they start sending you things that look like official correspondence from the government. And, and I've had clients call me and I warn them like, okay, after we file this, if you get anything from anyone other than me, you can assume it's a scam. Because once you have a trademark attorney file a trademark for you, the USPTO will only correspond directly with your attorney of record. They won't ever send you anything directly. So I've had clients call me and say, I'm about to pay this $2,000 invoice, and I want to make sure that you know, I'm sending it to the right place. I'm like, no, <laughs> don't pay that. Rip that up. So um, the answer is, unfortunately, no, there isn't really... Uh, a way to combat that. So if you hire an attorney, the practical pointer is unless you're getting something directly from your attorney, you can pretty much assume that it's, it's fraudulent. Um, and then with res respect to your second question, when you file a provisional application, it actually is confidential. So if you file an application, no, no, unless you share it with someone, nobody has public access to it. Um, and if you're concerned about Am I putting something in my provisional application that someone's going to be able to just come and exploit? The answer to that question is unless you share it with someone else, then the answer is no. Um, you, want, you, you, can't, you can't sort of hide your invention. Like the, the bargain that, that you're entering into with the, with the government, that's what a patent is. You're basically saying, I came up with an invention and someday this is going to be a matter of public domain, right? 
the, the U.S. government wants to incentivize people to basically invent things, right, and create new useful things. So the bargain is you have to basically say what it is with enough specificity that someone can basically actually practice your invention. And by, in exchange for that, you're making your invention public and you're granted a 20-year window of time in which even though everybody can pick up a patent and read it and see exactly what you're doing, they can't, they can't duplicate what you're doing while your, your patent is live. So you can't, you can't really hold back. The only way that you can, if you have something that, um, that other people wouldn't know, they can't figure out, you can protect it as a trade secret. And that's one of the benefits of trade secret is it doesn't have, a, it's not limited in time like a patent. So your trade secrets will consider to be protected as trade secrets for as long as you keep them a secret. So if you have a secret formula that no one else knows, instead of getting a patent on it and being able to monopolize that for 20 years, you just keep it secret and it's yours forever. As long as you put in the appropriate protections to keep it from not being confidential anymore. Yeah, on that note, maybe, I know you both mentioned that you've used trade secrets. Um, could you talk a little bit more to how you use, use that in your companies? You want to go? Well, I actually, talking about litigation. <laughs> <laughs> litigation, trade secret, is actually much easier litigation than patent nowadays. So that is why if you do have some algorithm that you think is a very confidential, I, I really strongly suggest you use a trade secret. And just make sure you all have a NDA, non like a non-disclosure with anybody, and that, that way if something got out, I know some successful cases that uh, something got out, you can guarantee win the case. Yeah, we're, we're, our trade secrets is, is an algorithm and a process, so uh, it's internally. You have your employees and teams sign the, uh, you know, employee contracts. Uh, so that's, that protects information, hopefully, from getting out. Um, and, and also uh, our process to marketplace, too. We're a medical technology company, and uh, we kind of fell into the right thing. We stayed alive long enough. We've been around for four years or five years now. But we've stayed, we've failed forward long enough to figure out what works right. So that's viable information that you want to protect uh, as a ta trade secret. So, uh, yeah. it's. Are you guys saying you're, the only way you're protecting this is just having your employees sign like paperwork, saying they won't share? There's not another. Is there a legal way of protecting this outside of that? Outside of just having employees sign it? Like there are some other documents that we should be filling out to protect those trade secrets. So the question is about um, what the formal process is for okay. protecting your trade secrets. So you, trade secret is a secret, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you're not supposed to disclose. Uh, I do want, I do know one successful case is that the company has a selling the product and then somebody did a copy it. But unfortunately, or fortunately, the company, every time when they signed agreement they, to offer for the service, they actually do have this non-compete and uh, those information in there, and that's how they want. Right. Same, yeah. non-competes, NDAs. Yeah. The, the tricky thing about trade secret is that um, it has to be something that someone can't otherwise do on their own. So let's say you have like, um, some kind of mechanical device. And maybe the way you came up with it was a very heavily guarded secret. But someone who's very skilled, you know, can look at it and say, I can figure out how to reverse engineer this. That might be the kind of thing where you can't protect it as a trade secret because people don't need your secret to figure it out. So that's where a case where a patent could be advantageous because even if they do exactly what you've done that's in your patent, but they've done it on their own. They never copied you or anything. For patent protection, it doesn't matter. They simply can't do it. So with the trade secret, you're right though, like legally, in order for something to be considered a trade secret, not only does it have to be a secret, but you have to prove that you have appropriate safeguards in place also to protect the secrecy of it. 
So like there's a lot of companies where if they assert a, a trade secret um, infringement, they have to prove that um, they have locks on their doors. You know, everything is secure. They only allow people that need to know it. So maybe even not everyone in the company even has access to the trade secret information, only the people that need to know. So there's a lot of things that in order for you to prove that you have something that's legally a trade secret, it's a great question. You have to actually demonstrate that not only is it secret, but that you have appropriate protections, protections in place to, to keep it secret. Can I ask one more question? Uh, sure. So you talked about there were two words in your patent that the attorney like put in there or didn't put in there that made it not qualified. What questions should you be asking when you're getting a trademark attorney? Because if it's two words, how would I as a founder know those two words are make it or break it? Like what questions should I be asking to vet the attorney appropriately? So the question, oh sorry, is about how do you, what questions are you asking to vet your attorneys essentially? So. I, I would ask if, uh, like I mentioned earlier, if the attorney has a litigation experience, that's definitely a plus. Because uh, down the road when you litigate, the guy writing the claim, so the patent is uh, on when it's go to litigation, the claim is really important. That's the one that two words ruin the whole thing. So, and uh, typically you want a lawyer write a claim because uh, also USPTO, you know that, the USPTO they speak a different language than we do. So I, I can't learn that. So, but the patent attorney knows. So, typically, you want them to write it. But some attorney, if they didn't have the litigation experience or they, they're not enough experience on the patent, that that could become worthy. Yeah. One more thing is uh, when you're interviewing your attorney, you might ask them if they have a mechanical engineering background or chemical engineering. It depends yes, on what your product that. or service is. That's super important for them to help you write your claims. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the engineering background, yeah. if you do product with a, like a, some product side, that definitely, because they understand you. Yeah. Otherwise, it's uh, harder to understand. Yeah, and I think another thing too is you want to be in, you want to feel like you're an active participant. Mm -hmm. So if I'm, you know your business and your technology, you will always know your business and your technology better than even the best patent attorney that you hire. But if they're basically just doing it and then saying, here's your patent application, yeah. you know, I filed it, it's all good. I mean, when I work with an inventor, I wanna ask them questions like, we've got certain words that are in the claims. And to make them broader, we wanna say, let's take out words that don't absolutely have to be there. And that sounds like the, the yeah. situation that you're describing. It be, because if you have words that, that aren't necessary, um, then it makes it easier for people to design around your patent claim. So even if you have a patent on your exact invention, if somebody can see that and say, well, all we have to do is just change this one thing, and now we've designed around it, oh, wow. your patent, even though you think, wow, yeah, I got a patent, but it may not really be worth much if it doesn't cover. You know, so those are the conversations that your attorney needs to have with you. you know, is this necessary? How, how could people can people design around this? And another thing, too, in litigation, is most patent infringement cases revolve around people disagreeing about the meaning of words. And it's, it's crazy, because you'll have two people with undergraduate degrees and law degrees arguing over what the word or means. Like, I'm not even exaggerating. It could be like that. And, and, and so that's why, you know, be, it's an art, like being very, very careful and knowing what you're doing in terms of why every single word is in your claims is super important. So if you don't get the feeling that your patent attorney is paying that much attention and is not engaging you in that process, then that's probably time to be a little concerned. So just my opinion. I saw a question over there. <clears throat> So the question was, if you come up with a trade secret, is there a possibility that someone else could also develop the same idea concurrently and beat you to the patent? And it sounds like. Yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely is a risk. So then how does prior art show that the already using this flavor and then they maybe dispute the patent? Yeah, the reason why you couldn't if it's a, it, so the question was if you, 
wanted to basically later disclose that, hey, I, like I, I had this first. So this person that's claiming that they have patented something that I've been doing, let's say for 10, 20 years, how can they assert their patent against me? So the, 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 the problem is if you protect it as a trade secret, then that information that you have is not publicly available. So because it's not publicly available, it, it's, it's not entitled to what's called, um, uh, it's not qualified as prior art. So that's basically what the Patent and Trademark Office is doing is they're evaluating whether somebody else is entitled to a patent based upon what's known. So if you have something that you've been doing for 10 years, you protect it as a trade secret, nobody else knows about it, and someone else comes along and they independently invent it, you know, so they didn't get it from you, they independently invent it, and then they get a patent and they find out that you're practicing what's in their patent, then they can, they can sue you and their patent would be upheld as valid. So. I saw a question over there. Uh, when you file for like a non-traditional patent, how many revisions and rejections do you normally see? So the question is when you file for a non-provisional patent, how many revisions and rejections do you normally see? Within that same patent. Within the same patent. I've had as much as three and four at one time before I just abandoned the patent. Uh, it, and I, I was previously in the novelty business and it's very, very tough. I had a lot of infringers and I've had patents issued with a lot of infringers and I had to decide if I wanted to spend the money on litigating or not. Most of the time it was like, forget it, I'm going to just keep making money. And then you know, I finally ex exited one of my companies. Uh, but I, I'm sure there's other examples that you had. Yeah, it, it, actually your attorney is a big it's really important on this because uh, the experienced attorney can navigate, can navigate to make sure like uh, between you and uh, USPTO, how we can make sure get issued and they even set up a conference so that we can talk through it. So, so there are, it, it, actually, I, I don't know there is a limit, but yes, yeah, you probably. Can, the, the way it works is when you file a patent application, it, it, this is going to sound counterintuitive, but if you file a patent application and the first response you, you get back from the USPTO is granted, that's actually not good because <laughs> no. that means your attorney <laughs> drafted the claims too narrowly, yeah. right? Yeah. So we're always going to start out initially when we file a patent application. We want the claims to be as broad as possible. So we're basically begging. We're asking. It's like in a negotiation when my kid wants to go to bed late. He's gonna, if he wants to go to bed at 9, he's gonna, he, if he's smart, he's going to ask me, can I stay up till 10? Right, so you're always gonna ask for more than you know realistically you, you really want. And so what happens is you're always gonna get a, a, an initial rejection and then you have an opportunity to file a substantive response. So that first one's called a non-final office action. Then uh, you file a response, a lot of times you get another rejection, but again, it's like you're negotiating with the trademark office. So now they're starting to tell you where they think you may have some success possibly or not. And so, you, the next communication is a final office action. So at that point, if you have the examiner telling you, I'm still not going to give you the patent yet, but if you make this amendment, then I'm going to give it to you. That's a situation where then you make that, that amendment and then you're done. So we get, have like two bites at the apple. A lot of times you're still basically just not seeing eye to eye with the examiner. So that, at that point, you have to rely on your attorney to be re realistic with you and say, you know what, based on what I've seen, I think there's like a very, very like minute chance that we're really gonna get this through, right? Or you may have your attorney say, you know what, this is not uncommon, right? So another option we have is to follow what's called a re request for continued examination, which basically means you just pay a fee to the patent office and it starts the process over again. So then you get to argue again, they, they give you another, non-final action, then you're back at the same place. So hopefully, like the goal is to have as few of those as possible. And if you get to a point where it looks like it's just not going to happen, you know, you have to have the trust of your attorney where you have to believe that what he's telling you is the truth. Because I've, I've had some clients where I even tell them, like, they want to keep going. And I just said, you know, I, I just don't see it. I'll, I'll try for you, but I, I don't think it's in the cards. And I've had some clients that they're just not used to this process. And so they immediately, their first time through, they're like, wait a minute, do you really know what you're doing? Like, we, this is like our third or fourth time, like begging for the patent office to give us a patent. And 
It's still not happening. So I have to really explain to them how the process works. And I've had situations where I've had clients, I mean, this is gonna sound like a humble brag, but I've had clients come to me and say, we've had this other attorney and for whatever reason, we don't, it's not working and we just don't feel like we have a lot of confidence in this person. And I'll look at it and sometimes I'll say, you know what, your attorney was right. Like there's no way this is gonna go through. I've had a couple occasions where I said, you know what, this is tough, but I wouldn't give up. If you're comfortable with the idea that you, it's gonna cost you X amount of dollars, and I'm telling you we probably have a 30% chance, sometimes some clients say, you know, we really need this patent. And fortunately, I've been able to hail Mary a couple of those through, so. I mean, your patent is whatever, at that point, like whatever you've asked for and whatever they say they're giving you, that's it. Like, so yes, you've got the patent now, but whether it's like really, really broad or maybe a little bit narrow or easy, who knows? You know, it's, it just depends, you know, each patent is going to be different. But presumably, theoretically, like when you get to that stage, if your attorney's done their job and if the landscape of the prior art is, you know, hopefully you do have something that's like super broad and very difficult to design around that that's that's what the goal is so i saw a question in the way back in the back i actually have a So the question is, how much does common law essentially protect your IP? Yeah. So with patents, for example, where you're talking about preventing competition, you're preventing someone from basically practicing the same thing that you are. You come up with an invention and you find out there's this guy across the street and he just magically came up with the same thing. You know, now what do we do? Well, common law doesn't protect you at all. In the only common law, there could be common law trade secret protection if you're protecting it as a trade secret. And the reason why this guy's competing with you is because he paid off your you know, software developer and, and that's the way he was able to create what he's now using to compete with you. That may be an example. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of one of the reasons why it's important to kind of understand you know, some of the things that you affirmatively have to do to, to get these rights. Like with trademarks, for example, you know, like I said, in some cases, by just using the trademark, that's an example where you acquire common law trademark rights. So you're not hiring an attorney. You're basically just creating something on your own, right? So if the business across the street decides they like what you're doing, you're a restaurant, they want to open up a restaurant, same kind of food, choose a name that sounds almost exactly like yours, that's a situation where your common law rights could, could protect you. So it just kind of depends. We have time for one more question, and I saw that you had your hand up earlier. So, my question, and, and I hope somebody said I'm cheap, and mm -hmm. since you are at the stage that we are, every dollar goes towards like, keeping the lights on. So, this question is a little bit about the relationship between us and you as the attorney. And it might sound cheap, but it is an important one. Um, aside from that provisional, So the question is about um, strategies to when you're and under a budget counsel. and still acquiring legal counsel. Yeah, 
Do you guys want to address this, or have you ever had a situation like that? Yeah, I've you... used a lot of attorneys, and uh, you know, when I first started, I didn't have any money. Also, uh, I've used lo big law firms and small law firms, and and you know maybe you need to uh, interview ten attorneys to see who might match with you or might love your business concept enough to give some of their time. And there's a lot of help groups in St. Louis, even uh, to uh, where, where law lawyers help. And they, a lot of law firms also donate time, right, yeah. uh, to, to, to the community. Uh, so that's something you can ask, too. Uh, so yeah, that's is, one of the Arch Grant. I think Arch Grant has a pro bono yeah. support for the legal service for the winning companies. And, hours, yeah. Right. And I actually went to your website today. I think you offer some fly race service or something. Yeah. So I'll so, like you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, basically, it just kind of depends on the circumstances. So, like I said, if I, I, I mean, I talk to people all the time that call me and maybe ask for like 30 minutes of my time. They'll just sort of kind of explain to me. So I'm happy to have a conversation with them and just to sort of give them some insight on things they need to be thinking about, right? And then there are things like, for example, like the statutory bar. I'll kind of explain that to them to say, hey, if you want to buy yourself some more time, then please make sure like you don't publicly disclose it right? Or if you are talking to someone, make sure that you're doing it under the protection of a non-disclosure agreement, right? So there are practical things that I can offer to people where I'm not like charging them for my services, but he helping you buy time. You know, I connect people with other clients or other connections that I have, people that, you know, are a lot, I work with a lot of startup businesses that have applied for and in, in, in obtained grant money or, you know, investors, things like that. So sometimes the benefit of someone talking to me is just maybe me being able to connect them with someone. Hey, there's someone that I think you can reach out to that I think can help you out. You know? But on the legal side of things, I think a lot of it is just, um, you know, a lot, maybe in some circumstances, I can't basically give you like an approach where you can kind of get this for free, but I can sort of help you from a timing standpoint, figure out how to, how to make it work. Yeah. 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 So, so I, I have people call. Yeah. The question is just about sort of how that relationship evolves over time. I, I've had people call me and I'll have a 15, 20 minute conversation with them. You know, they, they basically just say we're not at a point where we're ready in our business to, to hire you and engage you to do some of these things that we're talking about. And they'll thank me for their time and maybe I'll never hear from them again. But then someone else will call me that they, referred to me, right? Um, maybe I'll hear from them two years later and they say, hey, we just got a grant and you know we've got all these other things taken care of and we have a prototype and now we're really serious and we really need to get this thing going. Like, how do, how do we do that? So, I mean, it really just, just kind of depends. I think the biggest thing is just, you have to know the things that, um, that you, you can and can't do that are gonna speed up that clock. You know, like I said, the, the easy example is the statutory bar, right, for patent purposes. So there are things that you can do or you need to avoid doing to buy yourself as much time as you possibly can if you feel like making that investment today is really not realistic, but maybe a year from now it's something that... I think we're out of time. Yeah, if anybody has closing thoughts. There is there a panel of closing thoughts and then I'm sure that everybody would be willing to stick around for a few minutes yeah. So, any closing thoughts? I mean, I, I'm I'm cheap, also. <laughs> uh, so I've I've started a lot of companies and and failed forward, and yeah, I have to really evaluate. Can we smile when you take a picture? <laughs> uh, you have to evaluate uh, your technology and and you know the IP strategy and and if it's worth the money because what you know just like one of my first companies that I was fortunate enough to exit, uh, I had infringers all over the world on my patent, but did I want to spend a million dollars of legal fees on stopping them or did I want to save that money and and you know move on? So you know it, you, you don't know how good your patent is until you get infringement, and you don't know how good your legal team is until you, you know, have them, you know, fight for you. 
So it's a business decision. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so, so I have a very general question. What's your retainer? <laughs> What's my retainer? <laughs> so basically the way it works, the way it works is when I used to work for a big firm and, and mostly we did things on the bill of hour, <clears throat> based on a bill of hour. So you hire me, whatever time it takes for me to do the work for you, we're, you're going to pay me X hours times my, my rate. Um, one of the reasons why I left working for a big firm and, and I'm now working for a smaller firm is because we do have flexibility in terms of, you know, sometimes if we have a new client, we may, depending upon the size of the engagement, ask for a certain amount of money up front in, in, in the way of a retainer. Um, but I know for a lot of clients, in my experience, um, not to say that what it costs doesn't matter, but the biggest problems that I've ever encountered with clients or that I see attorneys encounter with clients is problems with, with expectations. So when you do things on a billable hour rate, it's like the attorney says, well, I think it's going to be $10,000. And then once you get into it, you get a bill and it's $15,000. And are like, well, it's got a lot more complicated than we thought it was going to be. But here it is. That's the time I spent. Most of what I do, I do, I do it on a fixed fee basis. So I sit down with the client. We talk to them. We figure out what it is that they want to do. You know, I know from almost 30 years of experience how much time it takes to do these things. And then we just basically arrive at, hopefully, what we agree is like a, a fair fixed fee for it. So then the client says, okay, like I'm happy with this, and I do the work, and they know exactly what they're, they're going to pay. You know, and everyone's, most of the time, everyone's super happy. But to be fair for an attorney, you need to know your product and business. You know it better than they do. So if you really don't know, then you're going to get charged more money. So, yeah, so. And, and I usually, when I work with the clients too, like to the, the point about writing your own applications, <clears throat> like it's a collaborative process too. So I tell clients, the more time that you put into this, the less money you're going to be paying me. If you don't want to do anything, and some clients just don't want to deal with it, I'm like, cool, I'll, I'll do it <laughs> if, if, you, if you want to pay me. But, but I always give the clients that option. Like, you know, if you want to take, I'm pr super busy. If you can do some of these things and save yourself money. So those are parts of the conversation too is, you know, a lot of, when I was at a bigger firm, not, I'm not saying bigger firms don't do this, but it was harder for me to, to do that. And I have a lot of flexibility having my own firm and working for a smaller firm where I, can, I, have, I have the discretion to do that. So, so when, you're, when, you're, when you're interviewing attorneys, Ask them about that. You know, can you do things on a fixed fee? You know, how do we negotiate this? So, may I ask one more question that I think is relevant to everyone? After you receive your ARCH grant, what's the first thing you do? Like, because some founders, you have, I know for me, I have no experience with uh, receiving a grant other than a $1,300 grant that I got that I still haven't used for the community, for a community event. but. What do you do? I mean, I, 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 we have like one minute. I always Arch Grant will guide yeah. you, actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 Arch Grant will guide you. They will tell you what they can help you, and then you pick what you want. So that's what I will, I will wait that. Um, and the one, my experience, St. Louis is a great city for startup, and there are so many free support that you can go like the seminar like this and that they're, the I tend to, they provide a support. So you ask, ask a support, ask a help, but ask people first before you spend a hell of a money to go down the road, right? So, so I would actually encourage everybody go down to go to all the startup events and ask all kinds of questions, collaborate with everybody so that you can really fine tone what exactly you want to do a high one. Thank you. Thank you all so much. <laughs> I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.